Hey there everybody and welcome back to another Friday Night Spotlight brought to you by Jones Ford Buick GMC, your hometown dealer for more than 50 years. We are finally in the playoffs for our bigger schools. Uh, lucky for us, we have three 4A schools competing um, to try to win a state championship. And we're going to kick things off with our lower seed and that is number six, Apache Junction hosting Kingman Lee Williams. Now... Apache Junction got a pretty big boost with their uh, regular season finale against Trevor Brown. They were around 8-9 seed and they got bumped up to the 6th seed. So David, what are you expecting from, from the prospectors in this game? Yeah, that big bump really shows what it means to, to beat a 6A team and they did so pretty well. They had a couple up and down times in that game. You know, they were they were up by 18 at one point and then all of a sudden they were only up by 3 but then they were able to get it back and get the win. So the, the prospectors to me, they're, they're like a hybrid team. You know, they're, they're both built to win now but also built to win for the future because we look at these three main guys that, that Coach Binkley has been talking about forever. It's Gavin Lamont at quarterback, it's Isaiah Savoy at running back, and it's Garrett Garcia at wide receiver. Now, these guys, Lamangelo and Garcia are juniors, and Isaiah Savoy is a sophomore. And these guys are producing big numbers for this team already. So they're looking to win now, but they also have plenty of ta talent to, to go through the next couple years and, and do some really big things. Uh, for this year specifically, though, Lamangelo has been a true a true dual threat quarterback. You know, uh, he's and he's such a big play extender. On multiple occasions, I've seen him, you know, pocket the pocket collapse on him, and he's just able to scramble all around the backfield and then he somehow either runs for a big for a big gain or he's able to just somehow find a receiver that's open and get a big chunk and convert a first down so the the offense can can look rattle the times but they are always in the game plan or always focused on what they're trying to do which is really something that is really fun to see um so for the keeper lee williams is to basically just contain the quarterback contain lamangelo to the pocket and make sure he's not able to escape and get out and make big plays like that they have to be good on the edge of their defensive ends to make sure that they can keep him in there maybe put in a QB spy with a linebacker to make sure that he's, you know, roaming with him. So wherever Lamangelo goes, that linebacker goes. So it'll be a fun clash to see what the defense does to kind of answer to this, you know, you know, guns out, guns out, you know, throwing all around and, and running all around for, for Apache Junction. So this should be a very competitive game. Uh, Lee Williams finished seven and three. So I have a feeling this one's going to be a back and forth affair and it could become a shootout. So it should be very fun to watch. All right, now for Lee Williams, they are led offensively by senior quarterback uh, Deviant Santos, over 1,300 passing yards, 49% completion rate, 14 touchdowns, but he does have uh, eight interceptions. This is going to be key to see what the prospectors can do. Um, I'm looking at Jacob Valentine and Hunter Delacruz to put some pressure on Santos in the backfield. So far as a team, the prospectors have 22 sacks. Um, Offensively, uh, the running game, uh, Lee Williams doesn't have that strong of, of, of a running game like the prospectors do. They do not have an Isaiah Savoy. Uh, Jimmy Berry and Cruz Yoakum, they have combined for eight touchdowns and around 900 uh, rushing yards. But their bright spot here are... There are many receivers and the uh, and all the different options that Santo has. Uh, they have Troy Edwards... Um, Angel Larios, Devin White, and just a bunch of these other guys who have from 500 to 100, a little over 100 uh, receiving yards. So it's going to be interesting to see what this prospector's defense can do to shut down all of these guys and limit what Santos sees down the field. David, is there anything else you would like to add about this game? Just again, uh, hope for a great fun match. It should be really interesting to see which team can be able to come out on top, and we'll hope for a good for a good one Friday night. All right, and our next playoff game is number two, Costa Grande Union hosting number 15, Deer Valley. CG Union is coming off of a bye uh, this week. They went undefeated in the regular season. They finished 9-0. and David, I know we sound like a broken record here, but which guys are, are going to get the job done for CG Union? Well, first of all, uh, CG Union, again, like we said, they're undefeated, and they it's the second time they've done it in school history and the first time in 71 years, so this is a pretty big deal for the Cougars, and this team is this team is stacked, to put it simply, you know, head coach Jake Barrow and the entire coaching staff have done an excellent job all year, and, but for the guys on the field, they have threats at every level. We've talked about Angel Flores forever now. He's proved why he's the best one of the best quarterbacks in the state of Arizona. RJ Keaton missed some games due to injury, though, but he was still able to cap around 
around 800 rushing yards and 13 touchdowns. So the, while the offense is great, I, I think the defense deserves a fair share of recognition as well. On three separate occasions, the, the defense pitched a shutout. They didn't allow the team to score any single point in the entire game. Three separate times they've done that. So this will be interesting to see how the defense holds up because Deer Valley is no slouch at all. They, they will not going to make it easy for the Cougars. They Their quarterback, Rudy Gonzalez, threw for over 2,500 yards, uh, 28 touchdown passes on nine interceptions. So And they have a dangerous receiver core. Uh, they have Tanner Bovich, uh, Ty Thomas, and Jordan McKee. They have all exceeded over 400 receiving yards. So Gonzalez has multiple weapons that he's able to go to if one of them gets shut out or double teamed. So this should be a really fun one. Uh, the Cougars are going to have to protect uh, and protect that passing defense as well. So this team likes to throw the ball. And they're gonna, and so CD Union is going to have to be able to counteract that with some good uh, quarterback passes of their own on offense and also see if Angel Flores can get it going with his feet. Because like we said, dual threat quarterbacks are, are the way of the future in, in football. So uh, CJ Union is going to have to be ready for this one. All right. David touched upon this, but I have to elaborate a little bit. I think this might be the most difficult opponent that the CG Union defense is going to see this um, so far this season. Unfortunately, their, their uh, regular season schedule was a bit soft, except for one or two opponents. Uh, David mentioned Rudy Gonzalez, but you also have to point out running back Ashton Hill. Over 1,100 rushing yards, 15 touchdowns. If you, if the CJ Union defense tries to lock up Gonzalez, look for Hill to, to um, start something on the ground. Defensively, they are led by a pair of Jacobs in Jacob uh, Cruzdigger Cruz and Jacob Quintero. Over 70 uh, total tackles as a team. They have 16 sacks for 81 yards. So Deer Valley can get into the backfield, and it's going to be interesting to see what the CJ Union offensive line can do to give Flores that amount of time. We know he's a scrappy quarterback and can run the ball himself, but I believe this is going to be the toughest um, um, opponent for CG Union up to um, today. David, is there anything else you would like to add? Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that, actually, because, you know, like we talked about, CG Union's schedule was a little bit relaxed, and that is nothing to go against them going undefeated. It's one of the hardest things to do in football, so that is a great, you know, testament to how good this team is, but this is going to be a true test, and they're really going to have to show why they've been saying they're one of the best teams in the state and prove, prove it on the field on Friday. So, I think this game could really come down to who makes the best plays at the right time and basically who scores last and whoever can control that lead. So this will be really interesting to watch on Friday. All right, and our last playoff team is the number one seed in Post and Butte at number 16, Phoenix Northwest Christian. Now, interesting tidbit about these two teams. They already met earlier this season. Uh, they met on October 8th, and Post and Butte won that game 35-0. David, I'm assuming... Um, Northwest Christian is going to be a little more prepared to handle the Broncos this time. What do you expect from them? Yeah, definitely. It always helps to be able to see a team in the regular season if you get matched up in the playoffs because you can go back to what they've done before and they were successful on. You can try to counteract that. So this one is going to be a real clash of styles for me, and I think because the Broncos calling card all year has been running the ball and running the ball at will. You know, they are deep in the running back position, and then their quarterback, Drew Damasio, is more, honestly, sometimes better, better as a runner than he is as a thrower. He, he threw for, uh, excuse me, he ran for for 540, 54 rushing yards and 14 rushing touchdowns. So he is more known as one of those running style quarterbacks where he likes to do it himself. And if he's in the end zone, if he gets close to the goal line, he just he has a way to get into the end zone no matter what. He puts on all the moves to make sure he finds a way to get in there at any time. So this one's going to be interesting because the clash of styles here, like I said, Post and Butte is more of a running team. And while Northwest, Northwest Christian likes to throw the ball a lot, you know, they don't really have a great running, uh, running, running scheme there. So it's going to be interesting to see how these two offenses go against each other. Uh, like I said, the running back core is deep with Post and Butte. They have about four or five different guys that can effectively run the ball for them if they need it. And then, although Northwest Question finished with a 4-7 and seven record, don't let that record uh, you know fool you. These, this team has talent, and it's mainly in receiver Kyler Thruston. Uh, the Crusaders receiver core as a whole finished with 1,739 rushing yards. Thruston attributed to about 35% of that. He finished with 603 rushing yards by himself. So this is going to be really interesting to see how the defense of Post and Butte is able to kind of counteract that receiving attack, uh, receiving attack from Thruston, and this will be really interesting to watch. I think it'll be really fun on Friday night. 
All right, now just real quickly going back to that October 8th game, uh, the post and defense limited Northwest Christian to 133 total yards of offense. That's saying a lot for this post and defense, and it also says quite a bit about Northwest Christian's offense. Um, in that game, the Crusaders used three quarterbacks. Uh, they combined for three interceptions, and as a team, their run game was only 34 yards rushing. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what adjustments they can make to try to get a little better production um, from their guys. Um, Post and view, Octav Octavius Joe rushed for almost 200 uh, yards and two touchdowns. Aiden Contreras also contributed over 100 rushing yards. So David mentioned it. We know what Post and view can do with the running game. How can the Crusaders try to slow that down? That's a very difficult task to try to slow down Octavius Joe, but if they can somehow manage to do that, they have a pretty good chance of staying in the game. I just say staying in the game because I don't really think they're going to be able to pull it off. Um, they're really dependent on two junior quarterbacks in Ashton Camp and Judah Huizman. Um, and they have around a 60% completion rate each. Uh, Camp has 737 passing yards, six touchdowns, Five interceptions, Huizman, 903 passing yards, eight touchdowns, five interceptions. The interceptions are what really hurt the Crusaders. And as we know, hey, Post and Butte has some guys in the backfield who can really make you pay. David, is there anything else you want to add about this final game? Uh, speaking on the other side of the Post and Butte's backfield on the defensive side, look out for Ja'Kai Robertson. He's a sophomore cornerback, and he has been putting on a pretty good coming uh, you know, coming out party this season. He had two interceptions in one game against Combs a couple weeks ago. I really think he, I've been talking about him for a while. I really think he could be something special if he gets the playing time in, in, in Friday night's game, depending on what their you know, cornerback and defensive back core is looking like. I think Ja'Kai Robertson could be really something for them in the coming years, and I think he could prove to be a real game changer in this playoff supposed to be able to have a good deep run all right and that does it for our friday night spotlight playoff edition be sure to check out canalcentral.com over the weekend to see how our three teams did